Right, so that's, a, that's kind of a mouthful, but the basic idea behind this claim is that um, at all scales, from the, the hyper-local to the global, the control of speech is a control of ideas, which means it's a control of the capacity of a people to challenge those with power. Um, the power can be political, the power can be economic, and oftentimes the two collude, so power and money go together, especially in, in uh, capitalist countries such as ours. Um, but what I wanted to do there was, especially in reference to my book, so book is, is stories of Wyoming, right? And Wyoming might be thought of as a rural backwater. So whatever those stories are about Wyoming, surely they don't apply to places like New York and California and Florida and Illinois and whatnot. But in fact, um, I, I really do believe um, that what was happening in, in my state, in my communities, really was just a, a highly focused um, uh, microcosm of the ways in which power and money uh, shape political speech. And so when I made reference to the presidential election, so we're moving from little Wyoming town all the way up to national election, right? This, in this last presidential election, there were no questions about climate change, right? Um, and sometimes um, we learn more from what isn't said and can't be said than from what is said. And the complete absence of one of the gravest threats to our nation as well as to our world, not being on the table for a presidential election suggests that the capacity of those with power, privilege, and money to shape political discourse um, is not something that happens in foreign regimes and rural backwaters. It's happening at the highest levels in this country as well. Well, one way of answering that, I suppose, is just by um, a quick review of numbers. Some, a couple, two simple numbers will tell that story in some ways. So the state of Wyoming, um, about 70% of the state's revenue into the public coffers comes through um, oil, gas, and coal in the form of either what we call mineral royalty taxes or severance taxes. They're called severance taxes because the resource is severed, right, from the public ownership. And though, so the idea is that that were compensated for the taking of the oil, gas, and coal. So those taxes, oil, gas, and coal taxes, account for 70% of the state's income. Okay. Now, that's a big chunk. So that's the makings, as, a, as I suggest in the book, that's the makings of a company town, right, when you're that dependent on one industry. Now, the question, though, pertains to the university or to other state institutions. Well, the university is a fine example. 70% of the, of the university's funds comes from the legislature, right? So 70% of 70 is 50%, 49%, 50%. So 50 cents on every dollar that flows into the university flows through oil, gas, and coal. With that kind of economic dependency um, and the consequent sort of fear uh, and, 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 I, and I don't mean to make it sound like our legislators are a bunch of cowards. Um, they have every right to be fearful. Of course, they've also failed to do the work necessary to diversify the economy. But here we are. Here we are. And when the fossil fuel industry is, is pumping that kind of money through the system, um, there's a sense of panic. What if they leave? What if they go somewhere else? Now, it's not quite as if you know, we could build cars in any city and Boeing could build a plane in any city. Apparently Amazon can put its headquarters in almost any city. Um, and so we do actually have some dependency of the industries on the fact that we've got the oil, gas, and coal. Um, but whether they are investing heavily in extraction in Wyoming or somewhere else and the degree to which um, they're going to fight our regulations is all a function of this, this kind of good old boy collusion between all right, between the politicians at the state level and the local level and these industries. And so um, that kind of, I mean, it's a kind of very worrisome uh, mutualism, uh, co-parasitism. Um, they both need the other in a very, very desperate way. Um, you know, and, and think about this nationally, though, right? So let's scale it up again. This isn't just about Wyoming. Um, according to some recent reports, the the typical um, 
congressperson in D.C. is now spending six to eight hours a day, a day, raising money for their next election. All right. So at least at least 50 percent of their time, and I'm giving them credit for working like a lot of us do more than eight hours. Right. So at least 50, perhaps 70 percent of their time goes into raising money for their next election, not doing the work of the people. Right. When they're that dependent on giving. And you know that giving is not coming in one and two dollar amounts from, from people like, like, like us. Right, those dollars are, are coming in, in, in one and ten million dollar chunks. And they're coming in in larger and larger chunks. And the future doesn't look any better in that regard at a national level. With Citizens United, right, uh, corporations are people and money is speech. Um, and so that kind of, of incredibly worrisome collusion of corporation and government um, at the national level is, is, is just this local mirror at the level of, of Rollins, Wyoming in Carbon County. It's, it's happening at all levels. The picture in some ways is clearer in Wyoming. There's, there's fewer complexities, but I don't think there's anything sort of uh, darker, more insidious. I think it's, I think it's everywhere. Again, this goes back to um, perhaps describing Wyoming in these sort of simple terms, right? Which, and, and we are, you know, if, if, a, if a, a political scientist or a cultural anthropologist or a sociologist wanted to set up sort of a laboratory experiment, right, to see what happens when you've got um, single industries controlling enormous amounts of, of uh, basically the public good, right? You couldn't do a better job than Wyoming, right? It's, it's sort of this, ex, this clear case. And, you know, so the other nice thing, nice thing, I think it's a nice thing about Wyoming, is we have fewer than 600,000 people. Well, what that means is there's a kind of transparency. So try to get information, try to get interviews, try to get stories in California and New York, right? So you're just one little schmo, right, among millions. Um, and so there's a level of accessibility, a level of transparency. Our legislature actually is, is not very transparent in some ways, but they're almost worrisomely transparent in others. And I, and I say that because they sort of wear with pride um, their collusion with the oil, gas, and coal industry, right? So it's almost a, a show of, of loyalty. Um, and so what in some states might be seen as grounds for impeachment in Wyoming is seen as evidence of, of, of political efficacy. Um, and it's that sort of kind of uh, um, audacious, if you will, um, transparency that makes some of these interactions, some of these deals, some of these agreements um, uh, so much clearer in Wyoming. Um, but again, you know, I don't think the story would be really that much different. Um, you know, if Boeing threatened to leave Seattle, if the U.S. Navy threatened to pull out of San Diego, Right. If, if um, uh, you know, there, there's lots of these these cases at sort of at uh, state or at least at, at local levels. And so what I, what I was sort of getting at in that passage is that um, the story I tell in Wyoming is a story that has a kind of clarity. Um, but I don't think it's it's a it's a cl the clarity might be kind of unique in a sociopolitical way. But the underlying corruption is not unique. It's just in some ways easier to see. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that we are harbinger, right? We, we are a test case of, of what happens when corporations, um, in particular single industries, um, become that intertwined with government. And what it means for things like elections, what it means for regulations, what it means for state agencies in terms of, of their agendas and, and what questions they can ask, what research they can do.
Well, I guess it uses its, its might in, um, in a variety of ways. Um, certainly, well, I can think of sort of three major right, paths that they take. Um, one is the direct influence of political campaigns, right? The energy industry in the United States um, each year pumps about $18 billion into, um, into political campaigns. Um, Washington lobbyists for the energy industry are spending about $120, $150 million a year. Um, the energy industry's lobbying budget is close to that of Wall Street and the defense industry put together. Right? So given how much it takes to get elected, right, and, and those figures are out there, you're looking at somewhere around $3 million to get a House seat, $10 million for a Senate seat. Right? You're going to go where the money is. And so um, the direct influence of campaign via campaign contributions is, is obviously going to be, be huge. And then once you've done that, you're not, <laughs> right? You're, it's a quid pro quo. You expect something in return. Um, and what you're going to expect in return, largely, uh, if you're a company, is uh, beneficial regulations. And it's kind of weird because we, we usually think that companies are going to pursue, and, and in general the energy industry does, but not entirely, um, we usually think they're going to pursue deregulation, right? And to a certain extent, that wouldn't be nearly as bad um, as what they often pursue, which is favorable regulation, right? So they want to regulate their competitors out of the market, right? So um, you know, I've worked with some big corporations when I was, when I was working in the College of Agriculture. Um, and I understand big corporations are about winning. <clears throat> and they're not about winning in a free marketplace. They're about altering the marketplace to their advantage. And you do that oftentimes just by regulation. Um, not abandoning regulation, but getting regulations that are favorable for you and disfavorable for your competitors. So those two things are certainly, certainly huge. The third thing is this, um, the capacity when a corporation or, or a, an industry has this kind of money to shape public discourse. And so, um, uh, you know, if we look back at the tobacco industry, right, and, and the games that were played with the merchants, what, the wonderful book, Merchants of Doubt, um, and the ways in which the corporations, the, at that time the tobacco companies, could alter the public discourse, could undermine the science, could, could confuse the conversation, could, in, uh, could create these echo chambers of sort of self-fulfilling uh, kinds of, of, of scientific, pseudo-scientific discourse. Um, all of those techniques that allowed the tobacco industry to draw out for uh, a phenomenal number of years the number of people who were dying right, of, as a consequence of their industry, but they were able to draw out that discussion to create uncertainty where none in, in fact existed. All of those techniques, all of those methods were picked up lock, stock, and barrel um, by, by the energy industry. ExxonMobil being one of the leaders in terms of, of sort of, of, of sowing um, false uncertainty about in effect about climate change. So when you've got that kind of money, you can alter the, the political choices we have, you can al alter the regulations that those politicians pass, and then you can alter the public discourse about the hazards that your industry brings to the public. Hey, that's the beauty of the whole system, right, is, is if it was some sort of of competition where candidate A was supported by company A and candidate B was supported by company B, right? But what in reality what happens is, is candidate A takes money from company A and B and company and, and candidate B takes money from both, right? And so uh, the companies are hedging their bets, right? They may not be given equally, but they're not going to, right? They're going to hedge their bets. Um, it, I mean, what they're doing, so you go to the racetrack, right? If you really know what you're doing is you bet, you bet win, right? I not bet horse racing very often, and hence I always bet to show, right? I win if he finishes first, second, or third. All right, given the uncertainties in politics, right, a lot of companies bet on their horse to show. Um, as a matter of fact, they bet on two horses to show. One wins, one plays, right? So, so it's that kind of hedging that's, that's going on. And as a candidate, right, um, you know, I'll, I'll take anybody's money and we'll work out the favors later. Well, actually, it's not the it's not the universities in Wyoming because we only have one. We have one public four-year university and no private universities. Uh, we do have a system of community colleges, so it's really about 
this one university, which is also some of this clarity, right? So, so we, we get a more transparent picture. Um, and, and maybe I'll just, just sort of answer that influence question with, uh, with an example. So the University of Wyoming, some years ago, um, it's probably about 10 years ago, right? Decided that it was, um, well, actually it's a little longer than that, but they decided that they were gonna have this um, very large um, private uh, effort to raise private money, right? And so what's happened in the country in the la since the Great Recession and even before that we saw the amount of public funding coming to universities was in decline, right? It was declining every year. Um, since the Great Recession across the board, 25% decline. So universities have, have a few choices, right? They can uh, reduce faculty and staff, which has been done. Um, they can increase tuition, but there's apparently going to be a limit to that eventually, or they can go after private money. Um, and most universities do all three, and, and we went after all three. And as a consequence, there were some very large givers um, from, oh, we might call them investors, from uh, the state of Wyoming, which Matt, you know, given our economic situation, meant oil, gas, and coal, um, both individual families and, and companies. Well, um, they wanted something in return. And what they got was what we now call the School of Energy Resources, an entire school with its own faculty, um, gorgeous facilities, all, right, all dedicated to energy. Now, there is a token investment in wind, but the lion's share goes to oil, gas, and coal, enhanced oil recovery. Um, so that was the payoff. So what we ended up with right, was a School of Energy Research. Right? Well, it, in most industries, one of the most expensive parts of an industry is research and development, right? It's uncertain, it's costly, you gotta pay people lots, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. So what they essentially bought was an R&D center, all right? And they got it um, on either tax-free donations and, here's the best part, once they had it built, the university agreed that they would use public money to match dollar for dollar any private money that came into that school. Right? So basically, companies say, well, wait a minute, so we get an R&D center and we get a 50% discount right, on all of our R&D because it's publicly subsidized. So we're publicly subsidizing the wealthiest corporations in human history because I guess they couldn't afford to do their own research and development. Um, and so what a boon that was right, um, for these companies. You know, the, what I say is it's, you know, it's the equivalent of taxing heroin and developing a, um, a program in your medical school um, uh, to refine uh, sharper needles, all right? And so uh, the weird part is a lot of the money that was coming into the state was coming through oil, gas, and coal and was being passed right back the other side to subsidize the R&D for those industries. Um, I mean, it's almost a money laundering operation, but probably not quite in a legal sense. Um, so what did they get? They got a hell of a deal. And so if we, so what, what I've been talking about is this, the energy industry, but if we sort of back up from that, there were a couple incidents at the university that laid the foundation for what grew into this tremendous corporate subsidy enterprise that we have. Um, the two incidents, one involved, actually they both involved faculty from our College of Law. Um, one of the faculty members was Mark Squalacci, he was a friend of mine. Um, and he um, was supporting a conservation group's efforts to reduce clear cutting um, in, in southeastern Wyoming. Um, and he was doing it, um, I believe, pro bono on his own time. But he was associated with the College of Law and the forest products industry went berserk. Um, threatened the law school, threatened to shut down the law school big kerfuffle and the university didn't go to bat. They didn't fire him, um, but they also didn't, right, they didn't go to bat. And then comes along Deb Donahue, another faculty member, who calls into question the public, publicly subsidized grazing lands in Wyoming, all right, federal lands that are, that are leased at very low rates for livestock grazing. And she raises economic and ecological questions there, publishes a book called Rangelands Revisited, um, and then there was actually a call in the legislature for defunding the law school. Um, I think it was mostly political posturing, but still the university sort of uh, played it softly um, 
let the fear pass, but really didn't go toe to toe, didn't say, didn't call bullshit on them, right? Um, and so there was this sort of tradition of, of not um, getting into the ring. And so we'd already laid the foundation with the forest products industry and with the, and with the rangeland grazing industry. And so when the big dog came into the ring, right, the energy industry, it was pretty clear um, that the university was not going to stand up. And in that case, um, as, I, as I talked about in my presentation, uh, the university buckled in a couple instances, one with the firing of a scientist um, who offended the energy industry, um, and the other one with the destruction of artwork um, that offended the energy industry, and both of those were sanctioned by the highest levels of the administration. Political censorship, in some ways, um, takes a certain amount of courage, right, for a politician to say, right, you're fired, let's go after him, right? We're, we're gonna disallow that. And so these incidents that we get into at the university and other places in the state with state agencies, um, our biggest art museum in Casper and whatnot, um, the, the potency, and sometimes you look at these incidents and you say, wow, they're totally disproportionate. Why, why is the industry going after a freaking piece of artwork, right? What the heck is that about? It's because it's not really about just that artwork, right? Why did they demand that Dr. Jeff Thine, right, lose his job because um, he gave an estimate of the amount of water needed for fracking, um, which they thought was was mistaken, but they wouldn't share their data, right? So you think, well, why, you know, why go after them? Why isn't that disproportionate? Well, what they're doing, I think, is is tactically smart, right? You make an example, all right? You post one head <laughs> on the spear outside the castle door, right? And it's pretty clear that you've sent the message. Um, and so you sacrifice. Um, you know, you, you spend a little bit of political capital to go after a piece of artwork, an artist, an educator, a scientist. But what you're doing is sending a message, right? And the message is, could be you next time. And so what you're doing is sort of buying self-censorship. And let's face it, an artist has I know lots of artists, right? They've got a, a, a thousand different projects going on in their head, and scientists have hundreds of different research opportunities there, and so they're trying to decide among these, and so they're trying to say, well, which one will be funded? Well, it could be a function of politics, right? And which one is gonna bring nothing but hassle, headache, and, and misery if I follow this line, right? Well, I could, you know, I could, I could go over here and do this. It's exciting, it's fun, it's interesting. It might even be in the public good. Sure, sure. So why bring that down on me, right? I saw what happened with, with Thine. I saw what happened with Chris Drury, the artist. Um, and so these disproportionate sort of punishments or responses by industry um, are really not just about that moment. They're about creating an atmosphere in which everybody understands that certain lines of creative work um, and scientific investigation probably aren't worth pursuing given all the other options you have. I take very seriously this concept of tenure. All right, tenure is a very strong protection of my job, which I take to be part of a profoundly important and intimate social contract that I have with the people of the state of Wyoming. And the deal is, right, that they will allow this system to protect me in exchange for me telling them the truth, right? If I'm not going to tell them the truth, if I'm not going to do the dangerous stuff, then what have I really, what have I earned, right? I, I don't need protection. What? Why do you protect a job that's not in danger, right? So I take it to be um, a part of the social contract that I will say the things that they can't say, ask the questions they can't ask, write the book for which they would be fired. So that, that was a big part of my motivation. Now, um, insofar as that's the case, I'm also not stupid, right? And so the book, manuscript, went through two legal reviews with the uh, University of New Mexico Press. They wanted to make sure there was nothing whatsoever that could be construed as a slander in the book. Um, in fact, the book has over 400 endnotes, so it is as thoroughly documented. When I say somebody said something, then you can go to an endnote and find out what the original source was. So one way of covering yourself, the, you know, the, there's this sort of little 
little sort of standard legal legalism, right? That the greatest, you know, the strongest defense against slander is the truth. Um, and so I worked very hard to make the book true. I also did two other things. I um, I did consult with with attorneys prior to the publication of the book, my own attorneys, um, to make sure there was nothing in there. And of course, <laughs> what they advise, I love attorneys. I do, I really do, right? They said, well, there's really nothing uh, in this book that, that could be reasonably construed um, as slander. But then on the other hand, this is America. <laughs> anybody can sue anybody for anything at any time. There's actually something called a slap suit. Um, and it's an acronym. Basically what it means is it's a suit to punish you economically. The person suing you has no intention of winning. What they want to do is rack up um, your legal bills and what it means is that they're monumentally richer than you are and they're going to punish you um, uh, via a, um, a suit of this sort. And their uh, slap suits are, are not banned in Wyoming. The other thing I did um, is I, it was, I was a little bit worried. I thought, well, you know, I did, I did write this book on university time, right? I, I did it at uni, university resources. And so I also in the book have said, and I have done, follow through on this promise, that all of my royalties are sent um, to PEN America, an organization dedicated to free speech and to freedom of the press around the world and to protecting writers and journalists from oppressive regimes. Um, so I don't make a penny off of the book. And I thought, well, um, we'll take that away from those who might criticize this venture. So I played defense. I mean, the other thing is, um, you know, sometimes the best defense is a good offense, right? Um, and so when the book came out, um, I have gone to seven communities in Wyoming, presented the book, presented my talk, presented my findings. I, I went to coal country, I went to gas and oil country. I stood in front of those groups and said, here's, here's the stories. Um, and I must say that um, I was not always warmly received, but it was never personal. It was never nasty. It was never threatening. Um, it was a good, hard, authentic discussion. And I knew people in these communities. I, and I know, you know, that they're living close to the margins and that they're depending on these industries in, in, in these places. Um, and that's why, you know, we, we do have a citizens climate change lobby group in, in Wyoming. And one of the things they're really pushing on is we can't talk about reducing fossil fuels as if there are no social costs, right? There's people, there's real people with real lives and real houses and real kids living in real towns that depend on these real mines and oil fields. And we've got to take seriously their misery as well. They count, right? Um, and if we're not going to take care of the misery we generate, then, um, you know, then, then we're not really serious about dealing with this problem in a holistic, compassionate, and just sense. Um, so it's complicated, but you know, my other strategy was just to be really out there up front. Now, in terms of response, it's kind of funny. So my, my opening lecture about the book was on the campus of the University of Wyoming. And the sponsor was no university department. It was sponsored by the Sierra Club that was allowed to use university space to host a university researcher, which is sort of bizarre. Um, it, was a, it was a nice packed house, I was really pleased, but not a single person in the audience um, was above the level of a department head. Um, no higher administrators, no deans, no associate deans, no provosts, no vice presidents, none of them um, came to that talk. Um, and so if there's one thing a university is good at, it's passive aggression. Um, we're good at passive aggression. So basically it's been icy silence, which is, is, is way better um, than, than lawsuits. I'll, I'll take it. Has everything we've been told been accurate? Well, most, much, some, <laughs> of what we've been told is accurate, right? These, um, so I gotta go back to one of my sources, the chapter on this fellow, Jeff Thine, the guy who worked at the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute who lost his job um, based on his estimates of the amount of water needed for a large fracking operation. Um, and he actually had a job before at the University of Wyoming. He was employed at Colorado School of Mines. Um, and he got in trouble there. Um, and he got in trouble there for this very simple but incisive observation. The, um, the oil and gas industry, the, the people who were engaged in fracking, said um, there's never been a documented case of contamination. Um, and 
Jeff noted that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. He said, the reason why there's no documented cases is because we're not looking, all right? So if you close your eyes, right, you can't claim that nothing happened in the room. That's the approach that, that's been taken, right? And so to a certain extent, they were right. Eh, no documented cases, but that's really not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? It's that I closed my eyes during the robbery, right? That's why I didn't see the guy with the gun. It wasn't that there wasn't a guy with a gun, right? So, um, so he made that point, and that didn't make him many, uh, many friends. Now, uh, his area of expertise is groundwater, groundwater contamination, and he said, God, this is crazy. Um, and I, I have every reason to believe this guy. I think he's credible. He says, you know, I don't know what the numbers are. 98, 99% of all fracking wells um, have integrity. They're fine. There's not going to be a problem. He said 1% or 2%, right? Um, but he said, we have the techniques, we have the methods. We could monitor, we could find out the bad ones, right? He said, this is insane, right? So all we have to do is pick out the few bad apples, assure the public that we're doing the responsible monitoring, and the vast majority of them are fine. The casings aren't cracked, they, they, they aren't going to leak. But he said, the industry won't allow it. They won't allow it because it's sort of the camel's nose under the tent, right? Because what it is, it's an admission that there are serious dangers, they have to be monitored, and that really bad stuff can happen to groundwater when it does. Um, and they don't want that to happen. So the other thing we don't know, and again, one of the reasons, reasons why we can say, well, they've been honest with us because they don't look, and that is um, there are laws in many states, including Wyoming, that the public is not, cannot ask and will not be told what the, the, the propens, the, 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 the non-water-based chemicals that are injected to create the fractures underground that, and, and to hold those fractures in place, we aren't told what those chemicals are. Um, we can't, they're called trade secrets. They're protected as trade secrets. Um, in Pennsylvania, a doctor, as I understand it, can determine whether a patient has been in contact with toxic chemicals, but he can or she cannot then share that information with other physicians in, in the region. It's a secret, and it has to be kept secret. Um, and so, you know, I, I tell my students, right, that, you know, there was a time before we had an EPA and before we had... Um, um, of uh, what we call the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act, the FIFRA, right? Where basically pesticides were, were, were freely used without anyone knowing what they are, where they were being placed, or what was happening, right? And it's like, wow, really? We sprayed crops? And I said, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's all very, very, very few regulations, environmental regulations, monitoring. It was, it was you know, kind of the wild, wild west of, of chemistry. And I, wow, that's remarkable. And I said, yeah, yeah, you sort of take for granted that, you know, you can get that information. You, you can ask what was sprayed, when was it sprayed, what's its toxicological profile. You can get all that, right? You can't get that about what we're pumping under the earth, potentially, potentially leaking into groundwater. You can't get that. So my, I imagine that in, you know, 20 or 30 years, there are going to be faculty members standing in front of their students saying, you know, there was a time where we could, we could pump, right, this list of toxins, right, in water, underground, with the potential for groundwater contamination should, um, should the system not maintain its integrity. And you know what? There was no law that said that those companies had to reveal the content of their fracking fluid. And the students are going to go, you've got to be kidding me. All right. And so are we being told everything about fracking? Well, we're being told some things about fracking. And, I mean, well, here we are in New York. I mean, you've got... Tony Ingrafia, right, at Cornell University. Boy, talk about a guy who was, who was talking about uh, some uncomfortable truths about uh, natural gas and, and methane and, and its greenhouse effects and, and the way the industry went after that guy. Um, uh, and so the story that we've been fracking for years and it's always been safe, that's, that's an oversimplified partial truth um, about limited data with a very clear effort on the part of industry to not collect data so that they can claim that, um, you know, we don't know what's under there and we don't know what its problems are. So, um, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of effort being put into the absence of evidence um, and we ought not to infer um, that 
that uh, the absence of evidence is in fact evidence that there's nothing going wrong. With the EPA, you know, at least now, um, and I worked, I mean, so when I first worked at the University of Wyoming, I have a PhD in entomology. I was hired in, uh, to do uh, grass, rangeland grasshopper ecology. I worked, with the, I worked with big chemical companies, right? Um, and the amount of testing that's required um, and the environmental testing um, is a quantum leap above where we were. Um, you know, and, and gosh, you talk about, you know, talk about fracking, right? So let's not forget, let's not forget the Halliburton loophole. Halliburton loophole said that fracking, right, is, is not under the purview of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, or the Drinking Water Act. Right? All of those are off the table with fracking and fracking fluids. It doesn't have to meet the standards of clean water, clean air, and drinking water. Um, that's called the Halliburton loophole, um, thanks to Wyoming's Dick Cheney. Um, uh, fracking was excluded uh, from that. And so, uh, I mean, there, so I have occasional moments of perverse sense of humor. Um, coal industry, of course, is, is uh, is in big trouble economically, and they're not in big trouble economically. Nobody who knows anything thinks they're in big trouble, big trouble because of regulation. Uh, it's just nonsense. Um, their econo economic troubles are all about natural gas. Right? Natural gas is, is killing the coal industry um, because they're producing it in massive amounts cheaply because of fracking. And of course, the irony here is that coal has to meet clean air, <laughs> clean water, <laughs> in Drinking Water Act, right? The Halliburton loophole only was applicable to fracking, and fracking is not relevant with coal. And so the fossil fuel industry, um, you know, coal should have screamed bloody murder um, during the early days of fracking, and they might still, ha you know, they might still have a horse in the race, um, but they didn't. And you know, this goes back to my earlier comment, right? That. We are not necessarily anti-regulation. What we're about is regulating our competitor out of existence. I can't think of any major extractive industries, or for that matter, any major industries that are unregulated. I mean, pharmaceutical industry, agriculture, mining, okay, they're all regulated. Um, the worry isn't so much that they're unregulated, it's that the regulations are are not necessarily in the public interest. They may be in sort of the interest of a non-competitive market. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's a real concern. And, and again, I mean, there's this word, it's sort of a mouthful, but I, I, I kind of like it. It's, the word is the corporatocracy, right? And so, um, you know, we, we refer to Russia as a kleptocracy, right? Klepto means, as in kleptomaniac, right? It's a theft. Right, so it's a, it's a government of thieves, which is probably not a bad description of Putin and the boys. Um, but our own government is looking more and more like a corporatocracy, right? It's a blending of the corporate and, um, uh, uh, and the government. And so here's how I think of, of corporations, right? Um, corporations are, are complete inventions, right? They're, they're not natural. We created this thing called a corporation. Um, and we created it with one duty, right? And uh, we gave it a fiduciary duty. Its only duty was to return, um, return profits to its shareholders, right? So it does one thing, it does it incredibly well, right? As a matter of fact, if a corporation, one could make an argument that if a corporation sacrifices its fiduciary duty for, say, an environmental ethic or um, or uh, racial justice, right? It's violating its duty, right? Those aren't its jobs. That's not what it does. That's not why it was created. It wasn't there to do good, right? It was there to make money and it's damn good at it. We made it to do it and it's really good at it, right? And so that's its interest, right? And so I think of corporations as sort of like being two-year-olds, right? They're amoral, <laughs> right? They're, they're, right? They're just, they're, I, I love my children. They're growing up now. But when they were two, they were just greedy little bastards, right? And that's what it is to be two. It's all about me, right? And you have to teach them, right? And the job of a parent is to regulate the behavior, right, of, of, the, of this little creature, right, that really doesn't have a moral compass, right? And, and you begin to build it in with empathy and whatnot, and, and that's the job of a parent. And, 
Um, and so what we have in the country is sort of like these gigantic two-year-olds, right, that also get to write the family rule book. <laughs> and then we can't figure out why the household is a freaking disaster. Right? It's because we put the two-year-old in charge. The role of government is sort of like the role of the parent. It's to regulate for the interests of the public right, the behavior of something that exists for the interests of its shareholders. Right? Its job is to regulate. And it's kind of a beautiful system. Right? You get a, com a corporation really good at its thing. Government, at least in principle, says, "Hey, eh, you know, we got to put some break." You know, I know that you know setting the Mahongahela River on fire was good for your company, but it's not so good for the people you know living along the river, right? So we're going to have you know we're going to have some environmental regulations here. So th that system seemed to be kind of functional, but what's happened is as corporations again begin to influence political offices. And, and political elections, and hence political regulations, right? This separation of kind of moral power and economic power is evaporating, right? And, the, and hence we get this corporatocracy. Um, we get banks that are too big to fail. Um, and we get fracking companies that are too big to be regulated. There are some corporations that have included in their charters, and there are some um, mutual funds, right? That, um, and again, if it, and again, it's up to the shareholders, right? So the shareholders can decide um, um, that, that, that you know, that in mutual funds, right? Their their advisors, you know, if I've got a mutual fund, I you know, I can do anything I want. I can say no tobacco, right, or no pesticides, or no big farm, or whatever I want. Um, and that's even that's even freer in a sense, right? Um, so I can pick and choose these money-making ventures, but I can pick the ones that align with some sort of moral principles. So that, you know, mutual fund is a way of doing that. Um, um, and of course we have, you know, various nonprofits which, um, which also can function. Although, I mean, just because you're nonprofit doesn't mean that you do good. So let's not confuse those things either. It's another example, right? So uh, all of my cases in Wyoming, this is what I tell people when I go around the state. I said, look, all these are about the most Republican legislature in the country, right, colluding with one of the largest corporations or corporate enterprises in human history, in the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> and so you could say, oh, well, he's just, you know, a, a, a crazy environmental Democrat. Um, and, and actually, I'm not crazy. I'm not Democrat. And I guess I am kind of environmental. But the point that I make is that, look, that's how, that's how power and money lined up in Wyoming, right? Um, shift that power, right, to the wind energy sector, right, and shift the politics to the Democrats, and I will assure you that they will do everything in their capacity to censor, to shut down public speech, and to quash criticism, right? So censorship is, is a tool of power, and it doesn't mean that it comes only from the right or the left. It doesn't mean that it only comes from the black companies, uh, you know, of, of the fossil fuel or from only the green companies. If you got power and you got money, you have an interest in shutting down public discourse. So public universities um, uh, have seen uh, a continuous Continue, and recently there's a little bit of an uptick, but, but since the Great Recession, uh, I think we're looking at something like a 25% reduction in uh, legislative or public dollar support for state universities. And um, for instance, in Louisiana, um, which is a combination of the Great Recession and oil, right? public university support, so the number of dollars that came to the Louisiana state university system um, through the legislature accounted for about 60% of their budget before and now about 25%. So that's one of the worst case scenarios. So again, everybody, all universities, for the most part, are seeing this erosion. And a lot of that, you know, is because of this um, very intentional belief, um, largely coming out of conservative quarters, um, that everything performs better when privatized. Um, one way of privatizing higher education is to start pulling the rug out from state and federal funding, right? 
Um, and so we see this, very, I think it's a very intentional move toward privatization. Um, and again, it's the notion that the market will do a better job, which I think is a disastrous assumption. But the point is that funding's going down, so there's, there's these three options. You can cut faculty and staff. Well, you start looking around and you think, well, God, all of a sudden, you know, tenure is not a guarantee if they close my department, which is true of most universities. What department are they going to go after? Well, the one that caused trouble, the one that upset the industries, the one that interfered with the big donors, right? Or the one that's pleasing the donors, that's pleasing the industries, right? And so that's a lovely, lovely formula for self-censorship, right? Is, is start looking at jobs disappearing, right? Well, you know, you're going to go down your little hidey hole and not stick your head up very often, right? So, there's, so you could do that. You can raise tuition. My worry there, of course, is as public institutions raise tuition, higher education becomes a privilege of the wealthy, right? Um, and again, who are the wealthy but the sons and daughters largely of those in corporate positions, and et cetera. So that becomes a sort of self-fulfilling uh, system. Um, and then the third option is are these large private they call them gifts. I think of them sort of as investments. Um, there's usually some sort of string or some sort of assumed quid pro quo involved. Um, and so uh, now we end up with School of Energy. We end up with the ConocoPhillips School of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Oklahoma. Right? So we have these named institutes and schools named after major corporations. Well, you know, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, right? Um, and it would be weird if they did, right? So, they, so wouldn't it be strange that the one altruistic thing on the planet turns out to be corporations? The rest of us are greedy bastards, but they know they're the good guys, right? So, I mean, that would be pretty naive. So, of course, they have an interest. Of course, they have an interest in, in, in the sorts of work that's going on there. Um, and so the autonomy, the reliability, the independence of scholarship, um, and even what's taught in classrooms. Um, and what's set on campuses um, is becoming more and more privatized. Now the weird thing is that's coming from the right and from the left. We have um, trigger warnings, hate speech policies, and efforts to kick conservative commentators off campus before they can give public speech. So universities are in this weird position um, of, being, um, of having uh, demands of censorship coming from both the liberals and the conservatives. Um, and it makes you wonder um, who's actually going to fight the good fight for free speech. The best defense against a biased education right, is not trying to flatten right, the content of courses. It's to assure that there is rigorous, continuous, and intensive education with regard to critical thinking. Um, so rather than I would rather the st we develop in our students their capacity to defend themselves against bullshit, right, than for us to become the filters of what it is they can hear in the classroom. Well, right, and, and so when, so this, this one story that I tell, that drew me into this whole thing. So there was this artwork on campus, it was called Carbon Sink, right, it was formed by these uh, beetle-killed trees formed into logs that spiral down into a a pool of coal, right? Um, and so drew the connection between climate change, the death of Wyoming forests, and the coal industry. Um, and this is what the energy industry demanded be removed. It was removed, sort of almost in the dark of night, generated this huge kerfuffle as it ought to have. Um, and in reaction to that, um, our, our student senate, so a student government, all campuses have one of these, um, they had brought before them a um, um, a piece of legislation uh, that would have reiterated, stated, confirmed um, the need for academic freedom, right? And in essence, pretty explicitly condemned uh, the university administration for countenancing the destruction of art, all right? And when that came to them, there was a, I was there. There was a, um, there was quite a debate, um, and the phrase that that still haunts me, and it's the phrase that won the debate, was the students who said, well, I talked to the legislators, right? And what they said is, you know, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, right? And so the students, 
you know, who, who pay very low tuition because of, uh, at that time, because of very high revenues in the fossil fuel industry, saw themselves as bought and paid for, right? They, um, they were domesticated animals. Their food bowl was filled every day, right? And it didn't cost them very much. And it was because of the oil, gas, and coal industry. And so the warning was, well, you know, do you want to bite the hand that feeds you? Now, when I talked to the president of uh, the student senate, I said, what did that mean to you? And he sort of resisted at first. And I said, well, God, when I was a student, right, the goal was to shred the hand that fed us, right? It was, it was to question. It was to demand. It was, you know, it was to, to doubt. It was to be skeptical. Um, I said, doesn't... What does that imply, you know, and he, he did pause and he said, yeah, I didn't, he said it is more worrisome than I have taken it to be. The vote lost, uh, the, the, the motion lost by a single vote. Um, and so they did not um, uh, take to task the university administration um, for censorship because to do so would have been to send um, a message of ingratitude. Um, as if the oil, gas, and coal industry paying their taxes somehow warranted generosity. <laughs> right? um, as a matter of fact, just a little bit off subject, but it's really important. So, so in Wyoming, the oil, gas, and coal industry have done a very good job via radio ads and whatnot of painting themselves as being generous supporters of the state, right? Of paying this um, severance tax. Um, and as a colleague of mine, who's actually an attorney in the Department of History, points out, they no more pay the severance tax than the loaf and jug, which is our version of 7-Eleven or whatever you want to call it, right? They don't pay sales tax, right? So the owner of Minimart, right, doesn't say, oh, what a great guy I am because I pay all the sales tax. He collects a sales tax from the people who buy the product, all right? And that's good. I mean, he's supposed to do that. And he passes it up to the state. The oil, gas, and coal industry don't pay the severance tax. They collect it from the end user, the consumer. All right? So there's no, I mean, they are no more generous to the state of Wyoming, right, than the convenience store owner is generous for paying sales tax. But again, if you control the discourse, if you control the language, if you control speech, Right? You can shape the impression of people as to what you're doing and what you're not doing. So this is like one of my great head-scratching wonders, right? And that is free speech, the First Amendment, right, should be uh, the common ground of left and right, conservatives and liberals, right? Um, conservatives, you know, claim to be constitutionalists. They love the Constitution. They fight for the Constitution, right? And then they countenance censorship, right? And the liberals, well, we're all about freedom. We're all about liberty, right? Except we don't want you to use hate speech and we want you to put trigger warnings in your classes. Oh, and you can only say potentially offensive things in this corner of campus. Oh, and by the way, if Ann Coulter comes on campus, we will protest and shout her down, all right? And it's like, oh my God, do you not hear yourselves, right? So it's, a, is this a battle for who gets to censor? What, are you not listening to the other side? I mean, to me, it's sort of like this, uh, in, in my world of, of ideology, it's my grand unifying theme. I mean, we even consider it, the United Nations considers it a human right. This isn't just, something encoded in our Constitution. I mean, these fields in philosophy were, well, of course, we don't want to equate what is moral with what is legal. So, so we, as philosophers, would stretch this notion of free speech, as John Stuart Mill did, even further than the Constitution would. And so it sounds like, you know, from the foundations of, of, of Western civilization through the left and the right, the Constitution and the United Nations, we ought to all be able to rally around free speech. And what we're rallying around is who gets to control it, not who gets to free it. I did that with a graduate student. I was telling them about this, and that, you know, they, they, they call these you know, bubbles, right? Inter internet bubbles, right? And so what the internet has done is sort of reinforce um, your biases, right? 
And so I was saying, yeah. And so, I mean, this, this guy is, he's young, right? Probably politically more or less like me, right? Socioeconomically, I got a lot more money than he does because he's a graduate student. So we just did that, right? And, and what did we, I think we typed in, um, what did we type in? I think we typed in um, Israel. <laughs> right? Ready, set, go into Google, right? And then we just read off, right, the top 10. Um, and I think six were in common, but none of them were in the same order. Um, obviously, they know my income because I got travel. <laughs> he got none. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, yeah, so the idea, I mean, the internet, the promise of the internet, right, was that uh, we would be able to work against our biases, right, because we would have information. And what it's done is simply entrench, polarize, and, and affirm our pre-existing biases. And it's, I mean, that's one of the grand disappointments of the internet. Well, God, right, and so if it wasn't bad enough, right, if it wasn't bad enough, we now are going to abandon net neutrality. So, so it wasn't bad enough that we had put ourselves into these bubbles. Now people can buy our bubbles. Well, they just took a page out, out of the book, right? And so what you do is you, you know, you create echo chambers, right? So you put out false information, you let it bounce around. You, you, you let one media pick it up and they pass it to another, and that just sort of bounces around, right? And then you, you sow the seeds of uncertainty. Um, you become a merchant of doubt, right? Um, and actually, the tobacco industry was very good at it, but it was actually picked up um, uh, by the uh, acid rain folks. Um, so all of the legislation having to do with acid rain uh, was also slowed down. So what you want to do is sow false information, sow doubt, sow uncertainty, um, confusion, ambiguity, um, uh, and slow things down. Make things go slowly. You can, um, you can grind the process to a virtual halt by saying one more study, one more study. One more study. We want good science. We're really in favor of science. Let's fund another study. Um, and so um, there's a whole package of tricks, and I don't think any one of them um, did the fossil fuel industry fail to pick up on. There's been this move, it was a very interesting move. So um, there was this move. Um, associated with uh, climate data and, and earthquake data and whatnot in Oklahoma, and it, went, and it even applied uh, to our state climatologist. And the notion was from coming down from government was, you know, we don't want to quash science, right? We want good science. But the role of science is just the data, right? You just collect the data. Data interpretation, data, that's not science. Science is data tables, right? You go beyond the data table, you're not into science. Now you're into advocacy. Now you're into explanation. Now you're into policy, which is just complete nonsense. Um, but it's a very nice way of government pretending or, or corporatocracy pretending, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we really want that data. Um, but all we want is the data. It's not your role to interpret the data. Data without interpretation is you know, like music that's not being played. Um, I mean, that is the function of the scientist. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting ploy that's been used with, uh, with various scientists, and especially agencies. You just generate the data. Well, they've done it in a number of ways, and probably the most effective way is, is through funding, right? So science is expensive. Um, and one of the ways of shaping science there's, is, is to uh, set up funding programs that uh, direct science in various, uh, along various paths. And in essence, if I'm not going to fund um, this kind of science, then you're not going to be able to do it. A good example of that was was an atmospheric scientist at the University of Wyoming who was doing some really interesting work in this, this area called a little, above a little town called Pinedale. It was the Pinedale Anticline, which is a geological formation 
that was one of the first places, one of the first places to show that fracking was economically viable. Huge gas boom there. <laughs> um, and so uh, then Pinedale started having these very serious problems with ozone, which is very peculiar, uh, especially it was wintertime ozone. Most ozone that we think of is summertime ozone, Los Angeles and whatnot. But Pinedale was having these winter ozone pulses. As a matter of fact, the air quality was as bad as a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, question was, where the hell is the ozone coming from? Well, so this guy went out and found out that um, through a, a, a really interesting and complicated um, chemical process, uh, the gases leaking from this gas field, actually from the pipelines, um, were, were interacting with um, a, a photochemical process and that, in fact, it was happening largely in the winter because snow reflection, light reflection off the snow was sort of catalyzing and making the problem even worse. So we were getting winter ozone. Um, and so he figured, well, it's coming from the gas fields. Um, and so he was, it, it was in the early stages of inventing this basically little drive around device where he could identify sources of leakage. And he thought that the, the gas companies would just love this, right? Because it's a little bit like the guy who wanted to monitor fracking. He said, look, 98% of wells are fine. Let's find the 2% that are a problem and shut them down or fix them. And this guy said, yeah, you know, I would bet that you know, 98, whatever it is, 98, 99% of the pipelines are just fine. Let's find the problem ones and fix them. Um, in that case, you don't even have to shut them down. Just fix them. Um, but again, what that meant was an admission that the problem was, in fact, all right, leaks. And so the gas companies, uh, the extraction industry, had no interest in that. Um, and so they went around to the State Department of Environmental Quality, and it turned out for two years in a row, that was the one proposal that there was just not enough money for. Um, and so uh, strategic defunding, um, or funding things in, in particular ways, very, very potent, and given the importance of, well, and so where are you gonna get funding for as a scientist? You're gonna get either from the federal government, from a state agency, or from private industry, right? And so that's probably in some ways the most potent way that government can shape via corporate influence. Um, uh, and, and I don't worry about scientists, I don't worry about 99.9% .9 of scientists falsifying data, right, making stuff up. Um, that's not how it happens, right? Scientists work very hard and they're, for the most part, wickedly honest. Um, the, the censorship isn't in altering their data. The censorship is in shaping the questions they, they do and don't ask, can and can't afford to ask. That's where it's happening. So I was invited to participate in the Real Truth About Health conference. Um, sort of out of the blue, right? This message came from Steve and I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm always uh, suitably suspicious. All right, so what's the agenda? What's the deal? Um, and so I thought, well, I better dig into this. I mean, I, you know, I've got credibility um, issues, right? I mean, I, I don't wanna. So it's just a bunch of wackies um, talking about crazy shit, right? <laughs> so, uh, that's my first suspicion, right? So I, you know, I even went back and forth with him. Well, how is this thing being funded? All right? What is your motivation? What's the agenda? What's this about? Um, right? And I couldn't find the hidden agenda. Right? I couldn't find right, the, the subversive aboutness. And, and then, so then I, then what you do, you know, again, it's like, how do you, how do you discover if something is, is legit? Well, you look at who else is involved, <laughs> right? So I started looking at other participants and I researched them on the web, right? So who are these people? And I knew, knew a few of the names and I, I knew some of the titles of the books. And, and, um, and so I thought, well, God, you know, it's a, this, is, this is a credible group, right? And, and I, didn't, I don't know that much about health. I do know about the environment, so that's where I focused my energies in terms of credibility. Um, and, you know, are there... Uh, so someone asked me, it was pretty funny, they said, well, what is this conference? And I said, well, you know, there, there's sort of like three places in the world, right? There's the Wacky Fringe, right? And I don't really want to be associated with the Wacky Fringe, right? And then there's 
the, the dangerous status quo. Right? And then there's this dynamic thing in the middle. Some are a little closer to the Waikiki Fringe and some are a little closer to the convention. But they're asking some hard questions. Um, you know, there's a, there's a publication in, in the Rocky Mountain region called um, High Country News, right? And they, they pitch themselves as news from the radical center. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, it, so it struck me that, that you know, th these are people asking some really interesting questions and coming up with some really interesting answers. And would I buy it all? Um, no, but do I... Am I intrigued deeply? All right. Are they raising interesting questions? Yes. Um, and then, you know, this semester I'm actually teaching a seminar on free speech and censorship. All right. And so, you know, I go back to some introductory remarks that I had um, in, you know, the the opening. Um, you know, I talked about real truth. All right. And I said, so does anyone have the real truth? They said, Psh, come on. For health, way too complicated. The environment, way too complicated. None of us have the real truth. If by that we mean the whole truth, right? None of us has got the whole truth. This stuff's way too complicated. All right, do the people at this conference have the, have the real truth? Nah. Do they have um, some really important partial truths that we've not been hearing? Oh, you bet. You bet. And, you know, John Stuart Mill talked about free speech. He said, well, you know, why do we want free speech? Um, and he, he, he was, you know, he's credited with this notion, the marketplace of ideas. But, but he also had this idea that um, suppose everybody at this conference is mistaken, right? Suppose they're wrong, right? Turns out that the status quo, the conventional norms of health environment, turns out they're right, right? Um, Mill would say, great, that's fine. First of all, we can't know it, right? Because we don't know what the truth is. And secondly, even if we did know it, and this is the important thing, even if we did know it, he said the truth becomes a dead dogma when it's not challenged because it, it isn't a truth that I have invested in. It's simply a truth that I believe passively. He said, so the truth right, has to always be challenged. Right? And so I don't think that most of the things I've heard are wrong. As a matter of fact, I think most of them are pretty right-headed. But even if they were, um, it wouldn't matter. This conference would be absolutely vital because it keeps the notion of us being responsible for understanding the truth alive. Right? We become participants, not passive consumers of other people's truths. Um, you know, that's why I said, you know, I really think the work of this conference is not on the stage. It's in the audience. That's what it's about. It's about giving people right, the information the ideas, the challenges, um, so that they can reflect on their beliefs. They can critically think about what they're being told. And if they come away um, from this conference not believing anything that was said, right, but, for, but thinking deeply about the things they believed before they came here, then, then that's a success. Because the truth right, is of their making, not of their passive acceptance. So. Um, uh, so when you think of it in that frame, um, and you think, as I understand, that I've not been told there's anything I can or uh, that I must say or can't say, um, then this is what the marketplace of ideas is about. This is the opportunity um, for us to, to, to be in conversation with one another about, about all the partial truths that we bring together and somehow approximate a little bit better, all right, what the real truth might be.